So that rule of thumb that you've probably heard, and I've heard it a lot too, is that a cow has to produce five cows before she breaks even. And essentially if the idea there is, well, we can only stand to have so much of a cow replacement cost embedded in every calf, or well, we just can't make money. Well, I, I challenge that a little bit because with that, there's something built into that assumption. And the thing that's built into that assumption is that the only time we ever sell a cow is if she's open, right? And, and there's a good veterinarian in the state of Missouri that always jokes, you know, it is legal in the state of Missouri to sell a bred cow. <laughs> and I, I always like to remind that, you know, I think that I think that's our obligation as cow-calf managers is to proactively divest out of cows that are conceiving late and, and redeploy that equity you know, in, into cows that are bred to calf early because they just have much greater profitability. They're less likely to become open cows next year and we can really manage that proactively. Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister and I am your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast where we connect you with beef industry experts and leaders to improve your own operation. Speaking of improving operations, I'd like to personally invite you to attend my monthly Rancher Mind events. Rancher Mind events are Q&A calls between cattle producers and industry experts that allow you as the cattle producer to enter a community of people who support and push you to find those improvements and connect with experts who can answer your questions and guide you in the right direction. You can find out more about these events and how to sign up by heading over to my website, casualcattleconversations.com. And while you're there, if you sign up for my newsletter, I'll send you 22 ranch management tips for free that have been shared by the gurus who have been on my show before. Remember, the best way to support podcast is to share, rate, and review the show so that I know what episodes and content you like and want more of. With that, let's connect you with this week's guest and expert. All right, Jordan. Well, it's great to have you on the show today. And as we chatted earlier, I mean, how fitting that we're going to talk about beef reproduction and some of those strategies. And you were actually AIing some of your own cows today. So that fits right. about perfectly, I guess. But to get started, can you please kind of just introduce yourself to those listening and just talk about what your role in the beef industry is today and what that looks like? Sure. So my name is Jordan Thomas. I'm a faculty member at the University of Missouri in our Division of Animal Sciences in the College of Ag. And I have a research and teaching appointment now. I started off with kind of an extension and research appointment. So I had an extension career for a number of years and uh, gave a lot of talks all over the place and wrote a lot of extension publications. I still do a lot of that kind of thing, but uh, I really enjoy the classroom as well. And so I pivoted to more of a research and teaching um, opportunity. And so I, now I teach the senior elective reproductive management and uh, coordinated internship that we have through MU that works with select sires representatives around the country. And uh, so I get to do some of that, uh, teach a little bit of the senior capstone beef production course as well, and then do a little bit of teaching in our College of Veterinary Medicine. So teaching uh, keeps me a little bit busy nowadays compared to what I used to do anyway, which is uh, drive all across the state giving talks and things like that. Uh, still cover a fair bit of the state um, research-wise, we have a research program that is pretty active on producer locations and then also on ag experiment station locations around the state of Missouri. So we have five cow herds in the state of Missouri system um, that, that we manage. Um, so I coordinate the breeding program for those and make some of those genetic decisions and, uh, and things like that. So pretty passionate about reproductive technologies like estrus synchronization, artificial insemination, embryo transfer. With you, uh, we do quite a bit of research in that area specifically. Um, we do a fair bit of work in heifer development as well. We have a show me select replacement heifer program in the state of Missouri that uh, I, in my extension capacity, help to coordinate. And whoever sort of fills that role now will, will take on some of that leadership, but uh, that's still something I'm pretty involved in. So it's a, it's a diverse set of things, but all kind of stem from reproduction. And because of all of the things that affect reproduction, I tend to have what I would call more of a systems focus. And I, I'm pretty passionate about grazing management and forages and things like that, that maybe uh, we wouldn't necessarily think of as traditionally being related to reproduction. It's not synchronization and things like that. Um, but I get passionate about really how all of those things end up ultimately affecting the decisions we make. 
Well, that's really important. And like the systems approach and systems thinking is a common theme that comes out on this podcast in multiple interviews, because so many things do impact, well, everything, it's all tied together. There's not really ever one singular component of beef production. So what is it about, you know, repro? Like, why did you kind of pick that, you know, diving more into that? Why would you say you are most passionate about that, even though you do like the systems approach? Yeah, you know, there's probably multiple factors in terms of what drove me to personally be interested in reproduction. I mean, number one, I would I would have to say was growing up with my grandparents cow calf operation, which in the state of Missouri, this is not terribly uncommon, but they just calved all year long, right? And so just an unmanaged reproductive system and um, and just seeing that and getting to witness just how kind of broken that is when you're, you know, pulling a calf on New Year's Eve and all of this kind of stuff. <laughs> and you start, you know, you so then you go to to an undergraduate program in animal sciences and you you learn maybe some more uh, industrialized agriculture models and you get really attracted to some of those kinds of things you start to ask maybe why why we're doing some of these things and how many systems and i i've almost come kind of full circle not that i am an advocate for a year-long calving but just in terms of thinking about um you know how do we how do we implement really practical things on commercial operations um, and, and understand what are really the, the drivers and human beings decision making at those levels of, you know, the, the kind of decisions that my grandparents were making or that maybe younger producers are making, what is really driving the decision making process. And, you know, I, I don't know that I was necessarily exposed to that as an undergraduate student, that way of thinking about what is causing human behavior, but I, I've read a lot of on that topic, you know, lately, the last maybe five years. And that's really changed the way that I think about what it means to impose good reproductive management and what a reproductive technology is, because often technologies are, you know, we sometimes think of technologies as being tools, right? Like your, like your cell phone or something like that, that that's a tool or that that's what technology is. And really, I would say that's, that's more of a piece of equipment or some kind of invention, but but the fundamental idea of technology is really how do you think it's applied knowledge. So uh, one thing that got me down that direction as an undergraduate student was um, Dr. Mike Smith's course in reproductive management um, and just his way of getting you to think like an animal scientist and just think differently uh, stimulated my my thoughts and, and interest in just how people think. And I think I've just continued to go further and forth, further down that rabbit trail. Well, that's pretty neat. So you said that you kind of grew up around an unmanaged system. What would be your definition or maybe some examples of what a managed system looks like on the reproduction side? Yeah, so so great question. Um, there's probably a lot of different ways to go with that. You know, one, one thing that we might think of is maybe traditional Western paradigms around um, a such and such season and a such and such season. If, if you think about why that maybe happened in high snowfall environments or something, why we would have spring calving seasons, for example. Well, often it was because that was the only practical thing that could could be made to work, right? And as you go south and east, um, and the environment becomes maybe a little bit more forgiving, what you'll find is that um, maybe there's more mismanagement because the environment will tolerate some mismanagement, right? Um, so in, for example, in the state of Missouri, it's not that uncommon to run into situations where it is just a completely unmanaged system reproductively. So imposing good reproductive management might look like bringing something of a traditional calving season into the mix. So that's maybe tier one, right? And that I would call really base kind of tier because, you know, in your part of the country, for example, everybody has a calving season. That doesn't even sound like a crazy thing. But, but I think tier two or, or maybe even beyond that is how short can we actually make that calving season? Um, and so for, for, for a while, I think you heard people talk about no 60 day calving seasons or something like that. And that became a very a good goal for many people. And, and you'll hear even a lot of extension specialists now talk about calving distribution and, and sort of that 60 day kind of language of what, what, what happened in the first 20 days, what happened in the next 20 days, what happened in the next 20 days. There's a lot of benchmarking you know, 65% of the calf crop should be born in the first 20 days and, you know, 25% of the next 20 and so on and so forth. Um, my thought process is maybe a little bit different than that, which is how can we proactively manage to, um, 
to actually divest out of females that are bred to calve later in that system and reinvest in females that are bred to calve early in that next calving mm -hmm. season? How can we select heifers that are calving early in that their first calving season just because of the, some of the lifelong implications of that? So we can do some of that with marketing decisions. We can do some of that with reproductive technologies, but it's kind of a little bit, um, I guess the way I think of it is just a little bit of a next level of management, which is how, how can we drive to make that thing as short as possible? Calving season distribution, or, you know, even just like for the calving, the length of calving season more, so not necessarily distribution is something that we've talked about on uh, the podcast or previous rancher mind events. And really that's something even I've noticed personally, like our calving season is 45 days. That's what we like to keep it at. But even at a 45 day calving season, you look at the bulls born the first week compared to the last week. And there's a big, there's a big difference. And you wouldn't think there would be very similar genetics, but just that 45 days can make a difference on how they're performing come sale day. I think that's right. You know, that's that's one of those things that's funny about human perception, right, is we perceive 45 days to really not be all that long of a period of time. It's a month and a half, right? It doesn't feel like it should be all that long. It's, you know, uh, less than seven weeks. It shouldn't be all that long. But a modern beef calf will gain, you know, roughly two pounds a day from birth to weaning. And so you, if you think about what a 45 day difference in age would be, I mean, that's pretty dang close to 100 pounds difference, right, at weaning. And that's a sizable difference on a percentage basis in terms of the total weaning weight of that calf, right? If that's a five, a five weight weaning weight, for example, well, that's 20% difference in its weaning weight at, at the time of weaning because of just that, those seven weeks, right? So, I mean, that's a huge, a huge difference, which I, I don't think we, we really perceive, you know, another corollary to that is not just the weaning weight of the calf or the calf performance, which is, is very visible and we see that, but also the effect on, on that cow, because that cow is going to calve on either day one of the calving season or day 45, right? And just to use those two extremes. Um, and, and so if you think about that cow that conceives and, and essentially goes on to calve on day one, well, now until the start of the next breeding season, if you do the math, she's got about 82 days, right? It's 365 minus 283. That's gestation length. So roughly on the average, 82 days. Cows will, will typically be cycling at 82 days postpartum. That's not an issue in most, in most cases, unless body condition score is really compromised or some other underlying issues are going on. Um, but if you take that cow that, that calved on day 45, well, you, you got to remember that she doesn't have to conceive within 82 days. It's not, it's not just that whole calve on a 365 day calving interval. It's really, is she going to be capable of conceiving on the start of the breeding season next year? And if you do the math on that, well, now it's not 82 days, it's 82 minus 45. So it's 37 days, right? Now, a lot of cows are not cycling at 37 days. In fact, that would be kind of the exception to the rule that a cow would be cycling that early. So, so I think that's, you just made a great example because a 45 day calving season, most producers would consider that to be pretty radically short, you know, and yet even within that quote unquote radically short system, look at the variability that we have from the, that's just due to last year's reproductive performance. So in a commercial setting, you know, we could choose to proactively market some later conceiving cows and replace that inventory with early conceiving heifers or early conceiving bred cows or, or what have you, and really cause some major differences for the underlying econ economics of that operation. Because I often make the beef production capstone course actually go through this exercise where they take an Excel spreadsheet of pregnancy diagnosis information and they project the profitability of those cows for that coming production cycle based on that information. And what you'll find is, well, if there's a hundred pound difference in calf weight, there's gonna be a sizable difference in calf revenue that that cow generates, right? And then if she also is calving later, she's disproportionately likely to fail to become pregnant in that next production cycle. So her value actually changes quite a bit as an asset. You know, she goes from being, you know, let's say you, you go from having 90% of those cows breeding up and staying bred cows and 10% being open cows to maybe something like 75, 25. Well, that's a major, major cost actually. And so it's not uncommon to have in a, in that exercise, have nearly a $400 difference in calf or essentially projected profitability or net present value. However you want to think about it 
of cows just from top to bottom. So it's a major issue, especially for commercial operations. So going back to that cow that calved on the last day of calving season, whether that was 45 days or 60 days, say that last cow to calve has a heifer that you potentially want to keep as a replacement. How does, you know, that heifer being the youngest one of the bunch impact her value as an asset when it comes time to breed her? Yeah, that's a great point. And uh, so you mentioned systems thinking already. And so I, I, I don't know how much exposure you've had to, to that, you know, formally. I did the, the King Ranch Institute system thinking class and her lectureship. And if you haven't done that, go do that because it's just really, really good. Um, but then also there's some great, you know, literature to just go read independently in that space. So one, one systems thinking concept is this idea of vicious cycles and virtuous cycles, right? And so a, a, a vicious cycle, I think most of us are familiar with, and that's that, you know, outcome A has this effect, outcome B, and that kind of worsens outcome A, and that kind of worsens outcome B, and that worsens, you know, and it gets worse and worse over time because there's this cumulative effect. So that's a, in systems thinking language, we would call that a reinforcing feedback loop that kind of continues to reinforce itself and just gets out of control. Now there's another kind of reinforcing feedback loop though. So the same kind of thing where outcome A affects option or outcome B and affects option or outcome A again and affects outcome B. But if you can imagine it being something we want to have happen. So something a positive kind of feed, uh, feedback. So when you get one of those, it's, we call it a virtuous cycle. So a great, um, great example in, on, in that heifer space is let's say we've got a long calving season and we have of our heifer calf crop, some of those heifers that we end up trying to breed are later born heifers, just like you mentioned, they're, they're born late in that calving season themselves. Well, we know from a lot of published data sets that later born heifer calves struggle to conceive early. So they become later conceiving heifers. And let's just say that you kept those later conceiving heifers and now they're later conceiving cows, right? Well, later conceiving cows, if they have a heifer calf, it's a later born heifer calf. And that problem kind of gets worse over time. And so that's a vicious cycle. Well, if we go in and we impose some management, which is management to maybe sell later conceiving cows or cause cows to conceive earlier. Well, what that does is it means that our heifer calves are older and they're heavier when they enter their first breeding season and they're more likely themselves to conceive early. Well, if they conceive early, they calve early as cows, right? And if they calve early as cows, they make calves that are older and heavier. And so that can become a, a virtuous cycle if we kind of keep the pressure on in that system. But one, one thing that's really tough in our beef cattle systems, this is another systems thinking kind of concept, is delays in seeing the effects of our actions or delays in feedback. And I often use this example of a, of a hot stove. You know, if you think about a hot stove, it's what we call a kind learning environment. It doesn't feel kind because it burns you, right? But, <laughs> it's, but it's kind in the sense that you get instantaneous feedback for your actions. So, you know, you're a little kid, right? And you go touch a hot stove and then what happens? You get burned and you get burned immediately and you learn from that feedback to not touch hot stoves, right? And I always, I always say this in talks, but imagine how hard it would be to learn not to touch a hot stove as a, as a kid if you went and you touch this hot stove and then you don't have any effects until two years later. And then two years later on that same day, you just randomly have this burn mark on your hand and you go, what in the, what in the world happened, right? It would be so hard for us to connect cause and effect because we don't get burned for two years, right? Well, the same thing happens with heifers, right? Because we later, later born heifers or later conceiving heifers, they fall out of the herd much faster, but they fall out as two and three-year-olds. And it just takes a long time for us to really see the consequences of our actions. But really it's our fault. You know, we, we need to kind of radically own that. We kept that heifer, right? I mean, we made the decision to keep that heifer as a replacement. Hey folks, it's Shay here. And I want to personally invite you as my listener to take the next steps in improving the profitability of your operation by signing up for my 2023 Rancher Mind series. 
The Rancher Mind program consists of producer-driven monthly calls that cover topics such as developing a reproduction program, labor challenges, cattle marketing, business development, and goal setting. I bring on industry experts each month to answer your specific questions. I also provide extra resources and a place for you to keep networking and moving forward without requiring you to leave the ranch. For more information, head over to my website, casualcattleconversations.com, and select the Rancher Mind event tab. Let's keep moving individual operations and our industry forward. So you said they fall out as two and three-year-olds. What is it? How many calves is it where cows are said to break even? Yeah, so I actually don't like that kind of language. I think that people say that a lot. And I'll maybe walk through the way that I think of it. Um, you know, if if you assume, for example, that you've got a bread heifer, let's just use some really even dollar values just to make it easy. Let's say that I buy a bread heifer for $2,000 and I sell her as an open cow, cold cow, kind of weigh cow for $1,000. And maybe both those numbers are wrong, right? But that just mm -hmm. gives you an idea. Well, that $1,000 difference in her value at purchase versus her value at sale is going to be divided over however many calves she produces over her life, right? Because that's a real cost. And sometimes we call that cow depreciation. So what is the depreciable you know, cost of that cow over that period of time? So you can imagine if she falls out in one year, that calf that she produces in that year has to cover all thousand of that dollars, right? And, and that's tough. Well, two years now it's 500 and, and three years is, you know, three something and, and so, so on and so forth. So that rule of thumb that you've probably heard, and I've heard it a lot too, is that a cow has to produce five cows before she breaks even. And essentially if the idea there is, well, we can only stand to have so much of a cow replacement cost embedded in every calf or, or we just can't make money. Well, I, I challenge that a little bit because with that, there's something built into that assumption and the thing that's built into that assumption is that the only time we ever sell a cow is if she's open, right? And and there's a good veterinarian in the state of Missouri that always jokes, you know, it is legal in the state of Missouri to sell a bred cow. <laughs> and I, I always like to remind that, you know, I think that I think that's our obligation as cow calf managers is to proactively divest out of cows that are conceiving late and and redeploy that equity you know, in, into cows that are bred to calf early because they just have much greater profitability. They're less likely to become open cows next year. And we can really manage that proactively. There's no reason why, to be honest, there's no reason why you couldn't design a program where you sold every cow at two years of age, right? If you were selling bred cows, I mean, that's wild and radical and whoever does that, right? But you could in theory design systems that made money doing that. And I, I think we just need to design our systems in such a way where we're not just only firing cows, so to speak, if they stop showing up for work. Have you seen producers in Missouri who do have, you know, unique manage unique systems like that where they are have found ways around that or they're selling cows at unique ages? Have you or do you have any examples of that? Yeah, um, so several actually. So in the state of Missouri, um, uh, one thing that we do in our ag experiment station at MU is we, in a couple of locations, use radically short calving seasons, and we will sell cows that don't concede. I know this sounds crazy. Don't concede. Don't concede to either AI or the next cycle back. So that's essentially a 21 day calving season. Now it's going to spread out a little more than that. It's going to be longer than 21 days. But I mean, if you keep the pressure up and you choose to operate a cow herd like that, you can absolutely do that. We do it at some of our MU farms. I, I do that kind of in my own system too, or certainly do that with heifers, right? So there's there's multiple opportunities to do things like that. I do know producers in the state of Missouri that use radically short calving seasons, like in that 30 to 45 day range. And they do that by selling a lot of bread cows. Um, and there are some there are some operators in Nebraska that I'm thinking of as well, large operators that do exactly this. Um, I actually just gave a talk, um, series of talks in Nebraska and Iowa. And uh, one of those talks that, um, that I had the opportunity to give, I think we had, oh, maybe 40 producers in the room, but between them all, they, they were above 30,000 cows just in terms of cow numbers. So it gives you an idea about how serious they are in the scale of operations and just what they were passionate about. And there were a number of them that were doing something quite similar to what I'm talking about, which is, you know, really at pregnancy diagnosis, identifying those cows that conceived late and choosing to 
sell those cows as bred cows and maybe have a higher annual cow replacement rate, but uh, but do that by selling cows that are you know still worth quite a bit of money as bred cows rather than open cows that are are coals. Well, thank you for explaining that and using those examples and going into that. I think sometimes it helps just to hear what other producers are doing kind of, you know, across the Midwest or country, really. So this is kind of a big picture question, and maybe there's not one specific answer to it. But if you could wave a magic wand and change one thing about how producers are managing their cattle, what comes to your mind? Yeah, it's probably the over reliance on stored forages, at least in my part of the country. You know, um, we we look at stored forages as kind of the industry standard kind of paradigm that everybody's stuck in. And I mean, largely, hey, obviously, there's other types of stored forages, too. But if you, if you go from somebody's got a quote like this, if you go from Mississippi and you look at how long they feed hay to how long we feed hay in Missouri to how long we feed hay in Minnesota, it's about the same number of days and, and it just doesn't really make a lot of sense when you consider the fact that um you, you know that is such an expensive cost of production and that in some of those environments we could really be proactive about minimizing the the need for that hay feeding season um so I, that would be easily my number one wand waving opportunity is, is <laughs> let's change that and, and the reason is because it causes a lot of additional cost. You know, it's not just the fact that we're feeding stored forages for such a long period of time. It's that we've got to have a lot of equipment to feed those stored forages. Mm -hmm. We've got to have a lot of equipment, at least in most people's cases, to produce and, and store and, and all of that for that those stored forages. Um, there's also um, just the, the additional cost of supplementation that usually goes along with feeding those stored forages. At least in my state, most stored forages are pretty poor in quality. It's, it's a, there's not a lot of high quality fescue hay that gets made. There's a lot of hay that gets made. It's just not very high quality. And so when that hay feeding season starts, for most folks, that means a, a fairly substantial supplementation program also starts. And that's just so spendy. And it's just hard to really, if we're honest about the profitability of most cow-calf systems in this country, it's really hard to build that much feed cost into the budget. Um, so feed is the number one major cost of production that's embedded in every calf pr produced. And so that's my first magic wand that I would I would go after. Is a, or That's my first magic wand I would wave to try to change is let's just get away from such a often overstocked model that involves a lot of stored forages. And then the second one is just related to all this reproductive management. And the reason I would go there is that the cost of replacing cows, kind of rebuilding that portion of the factory that burned down last year, you know, if you want to think about it that way, that is the second biggest cost of production that's embedded in every calf produced um, in, in most folks' budgets. And, and so if we could get those two major costs under control, we would maybe stand a chance to actually make a little money at all of this. Well, thank you for sharing your thoughts and wishes for the industry. I kind of want to yeah. <laughs> shift gears a little bit. And I want to hear more about the Show Me Select heifer program that you mentioned earlier. Can you talk about what exactly that is? Yeah, so the Show Me Select program was started by my predecessor um, at MU, Dave Patterson. And Dave Patterson, I really had a, a strong impact on the, on the state of Missouri's thoughts about heifer development. And I think I think what he really was good at getting people to realize is that the how those heifers are developed ends up affecting their lifelong performance. And, and so that if you can have a heifer that's bred to calf, you know, in an appropriate body condition score, and you have a known calving date on that heifer, and you, she's bred to a calving these bull, and maybe she's had her pelvic area screened, and, and sort of we know that we've done everything we can to set her up for success. He did a really good job, I think, in getting Missourians to really value that information. And so I often talk about Show Me Select as, um, you know, obviously there are very high quality heifers that sell through that program just from a genetic perspective. But I also just talk about them as being really high information heifers because producers are selling heifers that have gone through this defined management program and really are as bulletproof as you can make them, right? And obviously, heifers are going to be heifers. And so it's not like you're not going to have to touch touch one of them on occasion, but uh, they're just made to be as bulletproof as possible from a management standpoint. So it's been really valuable. We we always um, see Show Me Select heifers uh, 
receiving some sort of premium above typical market prices for heifers. Um, and, and there's really no criteria in that program for what they need to be from a genetic standpoint. You could use heifers of all sorts of different breeds. Um, and there's, there's not any requirement that says that they have to be, you know, uh, huge, large frame cattle or that they have to be little, small, you know, frame cows. So whatever your mentalities are about, you know, um, what you're trying to do in theory, you could put heifers in that program and, and market those, or, or you go to show me select sale and try to find some of those. So I think it's a really solid program. What we've seen, um, nationally is a lot of interest, not only in those heifers, they've sold into, um, a number of States, uh, really a, a lot of States. Um, as well as just about every county in Missouri. So they go all over the place. They're really in high demand. But what we've also seen is a lot of interest from other land grant, land grant institutions or even some partners um, in industry that are interested in, you know, doing something similar. And so one of those, um, oh, Kansas State developed a heifer program that uh, is somewhat patterned after Show Me Select. Um, I, I believe Iowa did as well and Florida did as well. So there are some programs along those lines. And then the Red Angus Association worked with us on a project called Red Choice, which was to develop some um, similar types of programs for commercial or registered heifers within the Red Angus breed specifically, just understanding, uh, you know, the perception of that breed nationally as being a very high maternal breed. And, and um, they, they like to say the industry's most favored female, right? So yeah. um, because of that, uh, because of that opportunity, I think they really saw the value of, you know, how can you package management along with that genetic reputation and maybe show that whole um, whole total package and heifers. So uh, I think that's been a really, um, really fun collaboration with them and just look forward to continuing to see how that program evolves. Well, thank you very much for explaining that and your time today. And as we wrap up, if there was one thing that listeners take away from this conversation, what would you like that to be? Yeah, you know, it's probably that a, a quote unquote short calving season is a lot longer than we realize it is biologically, just in terms of its impacts on our calf crop and the uniformity of that calf crop, the performance of that calf crop, and then obviously the breed back performance of those cows. And so anything that you can do to start moving in that direction is really helpful, even though it's so hard to sell cows that are bred. I know that it is. <laughs> Um, and I, I talk about that a lot. And if, if you can look in the mirror and realize that that limitation is mostly coming from us and it's mostly coming from the way that we see the world and the way that we think and the things that we value and the decisions we make, uh, then you start to realize that, you know, most of what we're up against reproductively in our cow herds is kind of us as human beings and not necessarily the, the cattle. And if, uh, I know that's a weird way of, of thinking, but uh, if that's the one thing that I can get people to think more about, I, I always encourage them to. Well, Jordan, I appreciate it. And thank you again for being on the show. You bet, thanks for having me. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.